Uh, welcome to this lecture on the nerves of the thoracic cavity. This slide brings us to the learning objectives that you should be able to answer at the conclusion of this presentation. Uh, first, describe the distributions of the phrenic nerve and the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. Compare and contrast the general functions of the autonomic nervous system. Describe the clinically applied anatomy of vocal cord paralysis and achalasia. Describe the clinically applied anatomy of asthma, pancose tumor, and cardiac referred pain. And then uh, we'll summarize the key take home messages from this presentation. And then lastly, provide attribution for the images that were used uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, this is the body map. And since we are looking at the nerves of the uh, thoracic cavity, we will be focusing in on this area in an anterior view, and then we'll also be looking internally along the posterior uh, thoracic uh, wall. Uh, the nerves that we're going to be covering in this presentation uh, are the phrenic nerves, the vagus nerves, the sympathetic uh, trunks, as well as autonomic uh, nervous plexuses. Our first nerve is that of the uh, phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is formed from anterior rami of the third cervical spinal nerve, the fourth cervical spinal nerve, and the fifth cervical spinal nerve. And uh, these uh, anterior rami help to form, uh, in part, the cervical uh, plexus. The phrenic nerve, once it's formed, will have an anterior course to the anterior scalene muscle. Here we see the right phrenic nerve on the right anterior scalene muscle in the neck. And then we see the left phrenic nerve running on the anterior surface of the left anterior scalene. Both phrenic uh, nerves are going to run on the lateral margins of the pericardium. They convey both motor and sensory uh, fibers. And the left is longer than the right. And if you take a look at the diaphragm, here's the right dome. It is more elevated than the left dome. So the left dome sits a little lower. Uh, hence, the left phrenic has a slightly longer uh, course uh, to reach its uh, destination. Uh, this slide depicts the distribution of the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve does have pleural branches. Uh, these will supply the costal and mediastinal parietal pleura that's associated with each lung apex. In addition, it has pericardial branches to help supply the pericardium. Those we can visualize in the illustration. Your right phrenic nerve is giving rise to pericardial branches in this area. Your left phrenic nerve is coursing uh, along the pericardium. You can see some pericardial branches here as well as here. The terminal branches of the phrenic nerve we see supplying the diaphragm. Specifically, the terminal branches to the diaphragm convey motor fibers. Uh, there are also sensory fibers in these terminal branches, and these are sensory to the diaphragmatic parietal pleura. Uh, in addition, there are sensory uh, fibers that will innervate the parietal peritoneum that is located on the inferior surface of the uh, diaphragm. And then our next uh, slide will help us understand a phenomenon referred to as referred pain. And to understand referred uh, pain, we have to understand the derm dermatomes uh, that are innervated by C3, C4, uh, C5. And if we take a look here, here is the dermatome associated with C3. It is bilateral. We're looking at the right side here. C3 is also shown here on the left. So it would go up into the neck, over the top of the shoulder. Uh, C4, a little further medial along the shoulder, coming into the midline, and then to the opposite midline, and over the top of the contralateral shoulder. Uh, C5 is not uh, depicted here, but again, C5 is a level that helps to form the phrenic nerve. Uh, C5 would course out here more laterally on the shoulder and into the lateral upper 
upper arm. If there's irritation of the diaphragm, such as accumulation of uh, blood in the peritoneal cavity, uh, the pain gets referred to these uh, dermatomal uh, levels. Uh, gallbladder can also cause referred pain to these same dermatomal levels, so the patient will uh, complain of pain in these general dermatomal uh, regions. Uh, the vagus nerve uh, is a cranial nerve. Uh, it, ha it is the longest of the cranial nerves and has the most extensive uh, distribution. Vagus is derived from a word meaning wandering, and so it does wander uh, throughout uh, the entire body almost. It conveys various uh, fiber types. Uh, these are somatic uh, afferents or sensory fibers going to the body wall. We also will see visceral afferents. So these are sensory uh, fibers uh, that are conveying senses from the organs. Somatic efferents, and so these are motor fibers to somatic muscles. We also have uh, two types of visceral uh, efferent fibers being conveyed in the vagus nerve. Uh, these would be general visceral efferents as well as special visceral efferents. And if we take a look at the uh, course of the uh, left vagus nerve, we see the left vagus nerve descending from the neck into the thoracic cavity and it is uh, crossing anterior uh, to the arch uh, of the aorta. And uh, the um, visceral efferents uh, that are conveyed uh, in the vagus nerve, uh, these efferents are parasympathetic uh, fibers. Here we're looking at the uh, same image, but I want to call your attention to the right side of this illustration. Uh, here we have the right vagus descending uh, from the neck. Uh, it was uh, cut and removed to show more clearly uh, some additional structures in this region. But here is your right subclavian artery. The right vagus nerve will course anterior to your right subclavian and then we see the distal cut end of the vagus, and then we'll see it continuing in the thoracic cavity along the right lateral margin of the esophagus, and the left one will also start to occupy here initially uh, a similar course on the left uh, margin of the esophagus. Now let's take a, a brief moment to explore the various uh, fiber types and their uh, distribution. Uh, this slide shows us the general visceral efferents and the general visceral afferents. The general visceral efferent fibers are innervating the smooth muscle that's associated with the respiratory uh, tree. We also have mucous glands that are associated uh, with the respiratory tree, hence they're innervated by these visceral general efferents. The heart also receives uh, distribution through this fiber type, and these same fibers are conveyed and distributed uh, to the esophagus. Uh, sensory fibers from the viscera of the thorax constitute the general visceral uh, afferents of the vagus nerve. Here we're looking at the distribution of the vagus nerve to the heart. Uh, these general visceral efferents are parasympathetic uh, fibers, and they're shown in purple in this illustration. So we have our right vagus here in purple, we have our left vagus, and then you can see branches are coming off the vagus nerves and are distributed to the atria, and then very sparse distribution uh, to the ventricles and the primary distribution uh, to the ventricles uh, would be the coronary uh, vessels uh, that supply uh, the ventricles. Functionally, the parasympathetic fibers being conveyed in the vagus uh, will decrease the heart rate. They have minimal influence on myocardial uh, contractility or force of contraction because of that sparse distribution to the ventricles. Uh, but they do uh, directly um, vasodilate the coronary vessels, and then the, those coronary vessels will subsequently uh, start to then uh, constrict 
because of the decrease in heart rate. Uh, this particular slide is demonstrating the parasympathetic uh, fibers that are being distributed uh, to the esophagus. Uh, these are the general visceral efferents again. Uh, we see both vagus right and then left here, and we see various uh, branches that contribute to the innervation of the esophagus. Uh, more distally, what will happen is the left vagus will come more anterior, whereas the right uh, will turn more posterior in relationship to the esophagus. And uh, the left vagus will become what is known as the anterior vagal trunk. The right vagus being rotated posteriorly will become the posterior vagal trunk. And this is due to developmental uh, events of the primitive uh, GI tube being rotated uh, to the right side of the body. Uh, there is a mnemonic to help you remember uh, which vagus is the anterior trunk versus the posterior trunk. That mnemonic is LARP, and this simply uh, means that the left becomes anterior, the right vagus will become a posterior. The visceral efferents that are generally supplying the esophagus are involved in peristalsis of the esophagus, and the parasympathetics will also allow for uh, a bolus of food to move from the esophagus into the cardiac region of the uh, stomach, thereby relaxing the lower uh, esophageal sphincter. Uh, if there is damage to the parasympathetic components anywhere along this pathway within the wall of the esophagus, we have parasympathetic components. Uh, mediastinal mass compressing the vagus, or even a stroke uh, where the motor uh, nuclei are located, any one of those kinds of events uh, can cause uh, failure of the sphincter mechanism, and as a result, you have a, a disease or disorder called achalasia. Uh, within the uh, thoracic cavity, the vagus nerve will give rise to recurrent laryngeal nerves. Uh, both of these recurrent laryngeal nerves are depicted in this illustration. So let's take a brief moment uh, for you to take a look at them. Here is your left vagus nerve coursing anterior to the aortic arch. And uh, right at this particular point, uh, we see the left recurrent laryngeal nerve branching off the left vagus. It will then wrap underneath the aortic arch and then will ascend posterior to it into the neck and here we can pick it up again, and it'll disappear under cover of the thyroid gland that we see here more superiorly. On the right side, the right recurrent laryngeal nerve has a slightly different uh, course to uh, ascend into the neck. And what it will do is it'll issue from the right vagus. We see the right vagus here. Right vagus, as mentioned before, will cross anterior to the subclavian. The subclavian has been cut right along here distally, and its more proximal attachment would be back uh, in this general direction. Uh, but right here, we can see coming off this distal segment of the vagus, uh, we can see the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. It would then ascend uh, along the, the trachea and then pass deep or posterior to the right subclavian vein and then would continue its ascent upwards into the neck under cover of the thyroid. The recurrent laryngeal nerves convey special visceral efferents, and these visceral special efferents are going to innervate all the intrinsic muscles of the larynx except for the cricothyroid. The special visceral efferents will also innervate uh, muscles of the pharynx, with the exception of the stylopharyngeus muscle, and the palate, with the exception of the tensor uh, villi palatini. Uh, if you have a mediastinal mass, such as a mediastinal uh, tumor, that uh, tumor could, in some cases, uh, encroach upon uh, one of your recurrent laryngeal nerves. And let's just say the mass is over here on the left side encroaching upon the left recurrent laryngeal. And if there's too great of an involvement of that mass on that recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, that can lead to hoarseness and even vocal cord paralysis.
All right, next we want to understand the uh, sympathetics uh, in the uh, uh, thorax. Uh, the sympathetics uh, in the thorax can be considered to be a relay system of two neurons. We have preganglionic uh, neurons. We would have their uh, cell bodies, and then we would have their axonic uh, processes. And that those axons will synapse with uh, postganglionic uh, neurons, their cell bodies, and then from those nerve cell bodies, we'll have the postganglionic uh, axon that will then reach out uh, to innervate the appropriate uh, thoracic uh, structures. The preganglionic neurons, their cell bodies reside within the uh, spinal cord at the following levels, uh, T1 down to T12, L1, L2, and maybe as low as L3, but we're within the thorax, so we're only going to operate at T1 uh, down to uh, the T5 spinal cord levels. So your preganglionic nerve cell body will reside in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord uh, in about this location. The axon then will extend outwards and then will enter through this communication here to the sympathetic trunk. This sympathetic trunk ascends and descends along the vertebral column. You have a right sympathetic trunk and you'll also have a left sympathetic trunk. Along the sympathetic trunks, you'll have these dilated areas, and those are referred to as sympathetic ganglia. Residing within these sympathetic ganglia are your postganglionic nerve cell bodies, and so your synapse is going to occur within here between your preganglionic neuron and your postganglionic uh, neuron. Postganglionic uh, Axons from those neurons then are distributed to thoracic viscera. And in many cases, what's going to happen is uh, they'll leave the sympathetic ganglion, perhaps at the same level in which the preganglionic neuron entered and come on out. Or they may go up a level or two, or they may go down a level or two, and then will have their axons leave at a different level from which they arrive from the preganglionic uh, neurons. Uh, also, accompanying the sympathetic uh, efferent fibers, uh, you'll also have your sensory or your afferent uh, fibers. So let's take a look at the specific innervation of selected thoracic uh, viscera. So here we're looking at the sympathetic innervation of the heart. Sympathetic innervation of the heart, the preganglionic fibers are going to come from T1 to T4, maybe as low as T5. Uh, so that's going to occur here, 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 and maybe as low as here. Uh, many of those fibers from the preganglionic neurons will enter the sympathetic trunk, uh, synapse with the postganglionic neuron. Many of those fibers are going to ascend into a cervical ganglia. And you have a superior cervical ganglion, you have a middle cervical ganglion, and then you'll have an inferior cervical ganglion that commonly will uh, join up with the first thoracic ganglion to form a much larger ganglion called the stellate ganglion. And then you have your preganglionic fibers being distributed uh, to the heart. You also have some from the more inferior thoracic spinal cord segments that are going out directly to the heart in this direction. So there is a question here regarding why do uh, these fibers ascend in the neck only to then descend down to innervate uh, the heart? And the answer to this question again involves embryo embryology Early on in the uh, embryo, the heart resides within the neck, 
And then with further development, the heart uh, will assume a, a lower location within the thoracic cavity, thereby pulling these fibers down uh, so that they descend. The sympathetics are involved in increasing heart rate, and because they are also well distributed uh, to the ventricles, they uh, are the major player in increasing contractility when they're stimulated, and then when they're inhibited, uh, they'll decrease the contractility or force of myocardial uh, contraction. Uh, innervation of the lungs uh, is um, innervated from preganglionic sympathetic neurons that are housed within uh, T1 through T5. So again, we're looking at the same levels with the distribution then uh, out to uh, the lungs. Sympathetic innervation of the lungs uh, will mildly vasoconstrict the blood vessels supplying the lungs. Uh, sympathetics to the respiratory passageways will cause uh, bronchodilation. And this is very, very useful uh, in individuals that are asthmatic. If they're having an asthmatic uh, event, uh, you want to be able to dilate their respiratory passageways. We know the sympathetics uh, do that as a part of their normal activity. Uh, and so you can then uh, administer uh, drugs that mimic the sympathetic uh, nervous uh, innervation. And those are sympathomimetic uh, drugs and then they will then produce the efficacious vasodilation during an asthmatic attack. Innervation of the esophagus is uh, provided by the same uh, spinal cord levels, again, T1 uh, down to uh, T5. Uh, this illustration doesn't really show you uh, the esophagus, but again, uh, spinal cord levels T1 through T5 will house the preganglionic sympathetic uh, nerve bodies, and then uh, the postganglionic nerve cell uh, bodies will send out uh, their fibers from the sympathetic trunks uh, to innervate uh, the esophagus. Sympathetic innervation of the esophagus inhibits peristalsis, just the opposite of what the uh, parasympathetics do, and sympathetics will decrease glandular secretions uh, that are coming from the esophagus. Uh, next, we want to look at the splanchnic nerves uh, that are formed from the uh, sympathetic trunk. Uh, we'll see them course within the thorax, uh, but it's important to remember that although they're found in the thorax, uh, they do not uh, innervate any of the thoracic viscera. Instead, they're going to continue on into the abdominal cavity uh, where their uh, functions are to innervate abdominal uh, viscera. The splanchnic nerves are known as the greater splanchnic nerves, the lesser splanchnic nerves, the least splanchnic nerves, and the uh, levels that contribute uh, to their formation are T5 through 9, maybe as low as 10 for your greater splanchnics. The lesser splanchnics are from more inferior spinal cord levels, T10 uh, to 11, and your least splanchnic nerves are going to be formed from preganglionic neurons that are housed within uh, T12. We do see two of those splanchnic nerves in the illustration. One is more clearly uh, recognizable. Uh, the lesser, we just see it forming. Uh, the least, uh, we do not see in this illustration. Uh, but if we take a look here, uh, we can see our greater splanchnic nerve coursing along here. This is your sympathetic trunk. And if we look, we can see some fibers coming from the sympathetic trunk at multiple levels uh, that will course and then ultimately form this greater splanchnic nerve. Uh, another term here, and the artist is using this, is major splanchnic. We also have the lesser splanchnic uh, starting to form here. And again, uh, T10 and 11 uh, will help form the lesser splanchnic. Lee Splanknik is not recognizable uh, in this particular illustration. Uh, for clinically applied anatomy, uh, let's think about a specific type of uh, lung tumor called a pancoast uh, tumor. A pancoast tumor uh, is a tumor of the lung uh, that will 
occupy the posterior thoracic wall and grow upwards along the, the posterior thoracic wall and start to invade and involve some neurologic structures uh, in and around the uh, subclavian artery. Uh, one such uh, structure here that's involved or may be involved, it's a stellate ganglion. As mentioned previously, the stellate ganglion uh, results from the fusion of the inferior cervical ganglion and the first thoracic ganglion. And this is, again, part of the, the sympathetics. And if it uh, continues to grow, it can also involve some of the inferior uh, roots of the brachial plexus. Uh, for example, uh, T1 and even uh, C8. If there's neural involvement of Pankos tumor uh, with the stellate ganglion, you'll uh, inhibit uh, the sympathetics, and as a result of that, uh, the individual will have uh, ptosis, a drooping of the eyelid, meiosis, as well as anhydrosis. Anhydrosis is an absence uh, of sweating. If there's a neurologic involvement of in the inferior roots of the brachial plexus, uh, the individual will have some uh, sensory loss uh, along the T1 and C8 dermatomal levels, which would be the medial uh, arm, forearm, and would have weakness of the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Uh, cardiac uh, referred pain helps us to apply some of the anatomy that we uh, just uh, uh, went through. As you recall, the spinal cord levels where the preganglionic sympathetic neurons were housed were T1 to 4, maybe even as low as uh, T5. Uh, so if you have pain coming from the heart through the uh, afferents going back into those spinal cord levels, uh, the neurologic processing uh, confuses that with the um, sensory fibers that are coming from uh, those dermatomes on the skin. And so you will involve uh, the T1 down to T4 uh, dermatomal levels. Uh, that will then uh, continue on into the medial aspects of the arm and even forearm, uh, as well as the anterior part of the chest, this is uh, showing uh, the back, but the nipple is an excellent landmark here to help you understand uh, where your dermatomes would lie anteriorly. The nipple lies within uh, the T5 dermatome, so the other dermatomes would lie above that. So if there's crushing pain and referred pain to the left upper chest that's radiating also into the medial uh, arm and medial forearm, uh, that would be uh, somewhat typical of cardiac referred pain, but I think the general rule of thumb is to say that cardiac referred pain can be more than what is typical, and there are gender differences as well, as cardiac referred pain has been known to radiate uh, upwards into the jaw uh, and also uh, can uh, radiate uh, to the back. Now we have the important uh, take-home messages from this presentation. The phrenic, the vagus, conveying the parasympathetics, and the sympathetics innervate thoracic viscera. Uh, the phrenic nerves are motor and sensory uh, to the diaphragm. The parasympathetics uh, conserve and uh, restore because of their tremendous influence on the, the GI system to process nutrients and to absorb uh, nutrients and to decrease the heart rate, whereas sympathetics do uh, the opposite. They elicit the fight or flight uh, response, uh, so they'll increase the heart rate, increase the force of contraction, and make us more responsive to these fight or flight events. Sympathetic preganglionic fibers originate from spinal cord segments T1 to as low as T5 when we look at innervation to thoracic viscera. Uh, these then will synapse some postganglionic neurons that reside in the ganglia of the sympathetic uh, trunks. And then from there, uh, the postganglionic axons are distributed to the thoracic viscera. Pharmacologic stimulation of the sympathetics uh, is efficacious in promoting bronchodilation during asthmatic attacks. 
a pancose tumor may produce neurologic symptoms due to involvement of the inferior roots of the brachial plexus and or stellate ganglion. And lastly, cardiac referred pain may be explained by the dermatomes associated with the segmental sympathetic innervation. And thank you for joining me uh, on this lecture of the nerves of the thorax.